Well, it is my pleasure to welcome Michael Cobb virtually to the Norfolk Library. He is actually just around the corner from us, but um, welcome everyone from near and far. Um, and Michael is um, actually extremely well-traveled person. As a young boy, he lived in Bergamo, Italy for a year where he developed an early love of languages, travel and global culture. He and his family moved to Norfolk in the early 80s. Michael took five years of Latin in middle and high school, which gave him a solid linguistic foundation and helped him learn Spanish quickly at the University of Oregon. After graduating, Michael moved to Sevilla and Barcelona, Spain and lived there for five years. Later, he lived in Saigon, Vietnam and eventually settled in New York. During this time, Michael taught English and Spanish to children and adults. Michael's wife, Martina, is from Galicia, Northwestern Spain, and they've been going there together for over 21 years. Today, he's focused on writing, music, and multimedia production. And he is sharing photos and stories of Galicia with some insider tips and a few surprises. So welcome everyone to Michael and a um, big round of applause, even though we're all muted. Thank you, Michael, take it away. Thank you, hola, buenas tardes, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I am gonna take you on a tour of Galicia, which is Northwestern Spain above Portugal. Let's see, I guess I should get rid of my image now. You don't need to see me. We're gonna focus on the slideshow. So, oops, Galicia is in northwestern Spain above Portugal. So if you can see where my cursor is hovering above there. And uh, it has nothing to do with the Mediterranean coast. <laughs> Most people think of Spain as being a Mediterranean country. Uh, Barcelona, of course, is on the Mediterranean. And this is important because Galicia is surrounded by the Atlantic Ocean. So it gives it a very different look and a very different feel. Uh, Galicia has much more in common with the British Isles, England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, in both its culture, its climate, and its temperaments. Let's get a closer look. So this is Galicia up close. For a sense of scale, it's about the size of West Virginia in the United States. And in fact, the whole country of Spain could, I've heard it said that it could fit inside Texas. Um, what's interesting about that is Europe, things in Europe, culture, landscapes, cities are very, are, are microcosms, you could say. So you cross the border and here, this bold line you'll see, this is the border of Portugal. It's a completely different country with a different language, culture, history, uh, et cetera. So today I'm gonna to take you on a tour around Galicia and we're gonna start in the south in the biggest city, which is Vigo. We're gonna take a look at some of the sites around there. And then we're gonna head north to Santiago de Compostela. This distance by car only takes about an hour, but it's, a completely different place and uh, its own place. From Santiago de Compostela, we are gonna head west to the coast. And if you'll notice that on the coastline, there are these inlets. If you can see my cursor moving, these inlets are called rias. And they, the closest thing I could compare them to would be um, the fjords of Scandinavia. So they go deep inland and that's significant because that's where you'll find fantastic beaches, safe harbor for boats, and it's where they uh, catch some of the world's best seafood. From uh, the west coast of, what's well, all the west coast, <laughs> from the uh, Rias Baixas region, which is what this is called, from the coast of Galicia, we're gonna head north. And this section of coast is called the Costa da Morte, the coast of death. And it's known uh, that way because the weather, especially in the winter, can be really wild and rough. And this has brought many ships and sailors to their doom. But it, 
It's a very dramatic, uh, beautiful, craggy coastline. From there, we're going to head up to the elegant city of A Coruña. Um, Galicia is its own autonomous region, which means that it's part of Spain, but they have their own language and their own culture. The language is called Gallego uh, by the rest of Spaniards, but in Galician, they call it Galego. And you'll notice that in uh, titles of cities like this. So instead of La Coruña, it's written as A Coruña, and we'll hear some more examples of that later. And then we're going to head further north to take a look at uh, some stunning beaches up here, and then inland to the city of Lugo, which is famous for its Roman walls, some of the best preserved in Europe. And from Lugo, we're going to head down to the ancient Roman city of Orense, we're not going to take too much a look at, at the city, but more uh, the wine region, which is called the Ribeira Sacra, the sacred riverside. The Romans came here to mine for gold and plant vines. So let's, let's start off with Vigo in the south. We're going to see what that looks like. Vigo is a city on the water. Uh, again, these fjords that go inland are called rias. And um, I'm not showing too much of the city because it's not necessarily the most attractive city, but it's in a beautiful place. It is, however, a very lively city. It's got great restaurants, great shopping, great nightlife. They really like uh, rock and roll. They love American style rock and roll. And there's a lot of great bands from, from, uh, from Vigo. And I'm a musician, so it's a place that uh, I appreciate for that reason. But uh, right outside of the city is this fantastic beach. Um, and one of the other great things about Vigo is its proximity to these two beautiful islands called the Islas Fies, which you get to by ferry. <laughs> Here's Martina on her way to the Fies with, with me. Uh, she's not a fan of the heat. Um, and the ferry ride takes about two hours to get out there, but it's a beautiful ride. And once you're there, the islands are, are really stunning. It looks a lot like the Caribbean, pretty, idyllic. The main difference between the water and the ocean of Galicia and the Caribbean is that in Galicia, the water is freezing cold. So think Maine, not Jamaica. <laughs> but it is really refreshing and really inviting. And on a hot day, there's, there's nothing better than um, the seaside at Galicia. And this island is a nature preserve. So there's no real hotel infrastructure. It's basically a big natural park. So all these visitors you see here, they come for the day and then they go back on the ferry. But in the evening, uh, you can get special permits to camp. I think these are some of the few places you could stay in the background are campsites. It's pretty rustic, uh, tents and so forth. Um, so there is that option. It's a great island to explore, to hike up to the top of this mountain you see in the background. There's a fantastic lighthouse. It's great for bird watching. It's just a beautiful place to spend the day. Looking back the other way, it really is spectacular. And then you take the ferry back into town. And here's something we haven't seen in a long time. <laughs> Crowds of people. Hopefully Spain will be able to get back to this soon. Um, getting back into Vigo. Some real gorgeous sunsets over the Ria de Vigo. And you can't really see in this photo so much, but in the background on this Ria, you'll see what look like, sometimes you can see what looks like uh, rafts. And they are, but they're not for, not like the rafts you would find at Toby Pond. They're used for cultivating mussels. So Galicia has a big Fishing and shellfish and uh, seafood industry are, are major industries in the country. So from Vigo, uh, again, it's only a, about an hour, a little bit less actually, an hour's drive north to Santiago de Compostela. Santiago de Compostela is without a doubt one of the most beautiful European cities of its size. It's a, a smaller city. Um, with a university, so it's a pretty lively city, young student population. Um, 
This cathedral is one of the best examples of Spanish Baroque architecture. Although it was begun in the medieval age, in the Middle Ages, and so um, there are parts of the cathedral that are, are much older than the Baroque facade from the Romanesque period. And that's typified by its simple, austere style. Um, but it's really interesting to take a walk around the cathedral because you can really see how the architecture evolved along with the history. And most of the buildings in Galicia, most of the structures and buildings are made out of granite. It's this uh, gray stone, but it really warms up in the evening light and is quite spectacular. And walking around the cathedral is endlessly fascinating. One of the best views of St. James Cathedral, that's what Santiago means, by the way, St. James, is from outside of the city center. So this is a view of Santiago de Compostela from Parque Bonaval, just a minute, a few minutes walk outside of the city center. And the views are quite stunning. You can get there from this park in about, in about five minutes. And it's a great park for families and children. Stella May is having a good time there and you can get another glimpse of uh, how everything's made out of granite. This is, this is the palette, the color palette of Galicia, gray and green. Crossing from Bonaval into the old town, this is leaving Parque Bonaval, going to cross into, into the old town. And the road, the crossway that you see there is where the uh, old medieval walls used to be, which unfortunately they took down to put in modern infrastructure like roads. But that uh, gives you a sense of uh, what was there. And so you cross the street into the old town of Santiago, the Casco Viejo. That's how you say old town in Espanol. And you get to Rua do Franco to the left here. This is all during Christmas. Spanish is primarily a Catholic country. So um, these are all the Christmas lights they have up. And the street to the left is Rua do Franco, which is famous for its uh, seafood restaurants, which they display in a unique way. And the seafood is fantastic. It is some of the best food. I'm biased, but it's some of the best food you'll have in the world. The emphasis is on super fresh, super high quality ingredients prepared in a simple unadorned style. Um, no sauces, nothing hidden between, hidden underneath uh, any kind of sauce. It's usually just, uh, you know, beautiful fish, fish. with, uh, someone might need to mute their, their uh, computer there. With a squeeze of lemon, olive oil, and sea salt, nothing better. So walking in the old town is a real pleasure. I mentioned before that Galicia is its own autonomous region uh, with its own culture and its own language. Um, everyone in Galicia speaks Espanol, but they also speak Gallego or Galego as they call it. And this sign is a good example of that. Bar, restaurante, entre ruas. Just about everything you see there is the same as would be written in, let's say, Madrid, except the last word there, ruas. In Espanol, which in Spain is known as Castellano, the Spanish language, you would, the word would be calle, you would say calle. But in Galicia, it's written and said as ruas. So that's an example of the difference, the linguistic difference between Gallego and Espanol. So yeah, it's a restaurant and a bar between the streets. And I love wandering these little streets, super fun, super charming. And these uh, arches that you see are called soportales. And the architecture of the city was specifically, specifically built this way to keep people dry from the rain. One thing that surprises a lot of people um, is how much it rains in Galicia. Again, Galicia has much more in common with the British Isles. So it rains approximately to one degree or another 300 days throughout the year. The day that we're having today in Norfolk, the rain, sort of light gentle rain would be very typical of Galicia. 
So the people who built the city, city had that in mind and, and built this particular, um, these supportales so that people could walk throughout the city without, without getting drenched. And it's really charming and you can see cafe life there on the sidewalk. And it's, these are uh, the ancient medieval streets of Santiago de Compostela. It's just, just wonderful and charming and, and it's completely pedestrian, no cars allowed. So it's, it's great for kids to run free and wild up and down the streets. And I love stopping by and window shopping and sometimes get tempted to go in and one of the best snacks you can grab is uh, empanada, which you can see here in the lower left hand side by my cursor. Empanada is a savory meat pie, um, usually stuffed with meat, seafood, or vegetables. The closest equivalent I could think of would be a, a Cornish pasty from the southwest of, of England. But we, we really don't have anything quite like it in the United States. Uh, the uh, Caribbean empanada from the Dominican Republic is somewhat similar, but it's, it's different. Uh, it's sort of like a uh, closed pizza, but much, much better, I think. And you can see various types of bread on sale there. Um, the food is really phenomenal, whether it's a snack or a, or a complete meal. And what could be better than chocolate con churros? <laughs> chocolate con churros is something you can find anywhere in Spain. And it's basically fried dough, which you dip into hot chocolate and it's, it's as delicious as it looks. So I mentioned before that Santiago de Compostela is a major center for spirituality and Catholicism. Um, it's also the end of the pilgrimage route, the Camino de Santiago, which has been traveled for at least a millennium. And you will see pilgrims coming into town with their backpacks who have traveled as far away as France, Germany, sometimes even Russia doing the Camino de Santiago, which when you enter Spain goes through the north of Spain and, and ends in Santiago de Compostela. And as a result, you'll see religious uh, and uh, Catholic knickknacks like this for sale and then street scenes like this. <laughs> priests crossing in the priests and monks crossing in the street. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty wonderful. Timeless, really. All roads lead to Santiago. All roads lead to St. James Cathedral. It is the end of the pilgrimage route. And by zoning law, nothing is built higher than the cathedral. So everywhere you go when walking through the old town, you get the sense of moving towards the cathedral. And so this is, this is just exactly that, moving toward, walking towards the cathedral. And it really is quite stunning, day or night. You saw the shot of it before, during the day, at night when it's lit up, they really do a fantastic job of literally illuminating historical monuments in Spain and with good reason, it's just stunning to look at. And the plaza you see in front of the cathedral is called the Plaza de Obradoiro. There are four plazas around the cathedral. This one, Obradoiro. There's also one uh, called Platarias, Azabache, and then Quintana. And they all have different uh, functions um, based on their historical, um, you could say, mercantile class. So let's see. The details around the sculptural and architectural details around the church are just stunning. I mean, this is ancient stuff. I, I don't have the dates on exactly when these sculptures are, are from, but this is the Baroque era. So the um, 16th and 15th centuries. Um, there might be some Romanesque in there too, but they've been recently restored and so they're, they, it's really amazing to, to see up close, get a sense of the uh, spiritual significance of the city. Another view of the cathedral. 
And this is the Plaza Obradoiro that I mentioned before. So an interesting thing to note, this building in the background is called the Hostal, excuse me, the Hospital de Reyes Católicos. And um, this was a hospital that was built to treat and take care of the pilgrims at the end of their, at the end of their pilgrimage. Today, it is a hostal. Hostal is uh, another way of saying um, hotel. And it's actually classified as being a parador, which means like a high-end fancy hotel. And it's quite stunning inside. And in fact, this is where my parents were so kind to give Martina and I our uh, rehearsal dinner for our wedding. And uh, we were all able to stand outside on the balcony here and look up at the cathedral at night. It's quite stunning. You can't tell from here, but there's really amazing gargoyles and sculptures at the top. And to the left here is the Ayuntamiento, the town hall. So anyway, this is where all the pilgrims inevitably end up to gaze up in awe at the uh, cathedral of St. James, La Catedral de Santiago de Compostela. And more churches behind the uh, Ayuntamiento, the town hall, that I, town hall that I mentioned before is San Fructuoso. It's a lovely little uh, church with some interesting architectural detail, clearly designed to remind people of their mortality and inspire their faith. And continuing to walk around the cathedral is are these uh, charming archways. And for those of you who've just, who joined recently, um, I'm not sure if you heard me say before, but Galicia has much more in common with the British Isles, including the fact that the national instrument is the bagpipe, something that surprises a lot of people. The bagpipe in Galician is known as the gaita, and we'll hear some of that music later. There are always gaiteros, bagpipers playing right here, and it's quite something to hear the sound of the Galician bagpipe resonating under these ancient arches. Here's another view of moving around the cathedral. This plaza is called platarias. Plata is the Spanish word for silver. And as I mentioned before, each plaza had, has its historical function. This is where uh, silversmiths worked. And to this day, there are silver shops um, to the left of this fountain. It's a wonderful fountain with horse, uh, granite horse sculptural work. And uh, it's just so beautiful to walk around the cathedral day or night. And the Gallegos and the Spaniards really know how to have a good time and how to make the most of their city. So uh, when the weather's good in the summer, they have big uh, festivales. And this is a festival of, I think of a Celtic group called Milladoiro, who we're gonna hear from later. And uh, it's a spectacular place to see, to see a concert and it's free and open to the public. Really quite something to experience under the ancient cathedral spires. So after a night in the town, you might be inspired to do some ancient olive tree hugging. <laughs> Just some more of the city's charm. Ah, so as I said before, uh, the stone structures in Galicia are primarily made, often, usually made of granite. And this uh, cross is known as a cruzeiro. Cruzeiros are built where, apparently built where someone committed a sin. And there are plenty of them all over Galicia. Again, the streets are pedestrian. It's great for kids to, to run and play free and has so much charm. The weather can change on a dime and can be misty and mysterious. This is also in Santiago. This is a church called San Martino de Pinario. More night streets. And one of my favorite things to do in Spain and Galicia is to hit the food markets. This is called the Mercado de Abastos, which has some of the best, freshest produce in Galicia. And one of the, besides shopping for food, one of the best things are these, um, eateries, these little uh, places to, to eat. And you know the food's gonna be great because it's coming right out of the food stall. If you see my cursor here, all these are the food stalls where they're selling fish, 
meat and cheese. And so it's a great place to go and have lunch and usually very affordable. Um, let's see, moving through the Mercado de Abastos, on the outskirts, you'll see these senoras, older women who, uh, let's see here, it looks like they're selling, she's selling some calabaza, pumpkin. Um, these are eucalyptus branches, which people use for, uh, well, it's good, good, for, uh, good for breathing. And it's, it's like a decongestant. And then this in this basket are grelos, which is a type of green vegetable, which we don't really have in the United States. The closest thing might be kale. And they put that in a hearty soup with potato and uh, white beans. That's called caldo gallego. That's one of the most typical things you could have in Galicia. It's really invigorating. And these dignified elderly women are really, uh, I don't know, quite something to see. And uh, it's great. It's a great place for photography. It's an authentic slice of Galician life. So headed west from Santiago de Compostela, we go to the coast. And the mid coastal region is Rias Baixas. This particular town where my wife's family comes from is called Palmeira. And as I mentioned before, it rains most of the year. Most of the year, it's, it's like the way it's raining outside today. That's the way Galicia is for most of the year. The upside of that is that that has prevented a lot of the horrific overdevelopment that you'll see in the Mediterranean coast. And so you just get these lovely pristine beaches. So in the summer, it's, it's really fantastic. Another view of Palmeira, this particular beach is called La Corna. Funny thing. Um, so like Ireland, uh, there is many, many ways of immigration around the world. And interesting thing, in this particular town of Palmeira, um, many of the Galicians immigrated to New Jersey. So you'll hear people speaking English on this beach and wearing uh, Mets baseball hats or, you know, <laughs> Jets baseball, excuse me, Jets football t-shirts. Um, so you'll hear a fair amount of English spoken here. And those, those are Galician Americans returning home for the holidays. The next town up, people might have immigrated to Venezuela. So it could be a completely different uh, reverse immigration phenomenon. Heading north through the, or, th or throughout the Rias Baixas, we go to Albariño lands. Albariño is the white wine uh, that goes so well with uh, seafood and shellfish. It's really beautiful. And speaking of shellfish, uh, I mentioned a bit before about the food. Galician cuisine uh, is super simple in its preparation, unadorned, no sauces, nothing hidden. It's just top quality product. Here, probably the only thing that they did was pour on a little high quality olive oil, sea salt, squirt of lemon, some parsley, what else do you need? And the scallop shell, it's also interesting to note, is the symbol of the pilgrimage of the Camino de Santiago. So you'll see pilgrims wearing scallop shells around their neck. You can tell I've been going to Galicia for a long time because I don't look this young anymore. <laughs> but um, here I am enjoying one of the classic ubiquitous dishes, which is pulpo a la galega. Galician octopus, they dip it, the poor creature, in boiling water three times to tenderize it, cut it up, serve it on potatoes, drizzled with olive oil, sea salt, and paprika with a loaf of crusty bread, eaten with a toothpick. There's nothing better. And the fish is off the hook. Excuse the pun. Again, simple preparation. Potatoes in Galicia, the simplest thing. The potatoes are just so much better than anything we get over here. Generally, everything is organic. They don't call it that, but it, it, it just is. And uh, served with the side of broccoli and uh, pickled cabbage, it's, it's great. So as I said before, um, the interior of Galicia, the whole of the country is is often under a cloud system coming in from the Atlantic. 
But when it clears, you get these beautiful views and it's, it's green and lush like Ireland. It's great to explore the coasts. It's great to explore the mountains. It's great to explore the interior. Mountain biking is a really fun way to do it. And you will run into <laughs> just these charming scenes, things like this frequently, sheep crossing the road. Ovejas in Espanol. Roadside poetry. Heading a bit further up the coast near the town of Muros is this lovely beach. Uh, beaches are just out of this world fantastic. Again, you can see what I'm talking about. On the Mediterranean, you might have, you might see a lot of development with, with hotels, much less so in Galicia. Um, they have much better laws about conservation. And so it's just really stunning to go to these places. Um, you do have to be careful about the tides and the ocean can be tricky and treacherous, but this is a safe one and it's a family friendly place. So a bit about the history. Um, Galicia, uh, the prehistory of Galicia includes prehistoric structures like this. It's like a mini Stonehenge known as a dolmen. This particular dolmen is called the Dolmen de Achetos, most likely a burial mound or a funerary pyre. Um, this dates back to around 300 BC. So this structure is probably, probably about 5,000 years old. And it's inter interesting to note that my wife's complete name is Martina Gago Achetos, as in the Dolmen de Achetos and her family is from this area. So you can say that her family roots go very deep. So after the prehistoric period uh, was the Celtic period of history and the Celts settled in this fantastic spot, which is one of my favorite places in all of Galicia called the Castro de Baronia. Castros are these stone, circular stone foundations so they, they would build a house on top of these, usually out of, out of straw. And there's some places in Galicia where you still see people actively living in, in Castros to this day. But these are ruins that were discovered about 20, 30, I guess about 30 years ago now. It was all overgrown. And uh, they unearthed them on an archeological dig. And it's just a fantastic, magical, mystical spot. The Beach is gorgeous and it's great for swimming, but as you can see, the water can be pretty rough and you have to be careful. People do get swept out to sea every year. So it's uh, for strong swimmers only here. It's also fair warning, a nudist beach. <laughs> the sunsets are really stunning. And that is looking further north uh, along the coast. As you go further north, along the coast. Well, hold that thought. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, this is again in the town of Palmeira where my wife comes from. At times Galicia can, can look like almost like Mediterranean Spain, but then you come into these little stone villages and you're reminded that it's a uh, Celtic country. Again, more in common with Ireland or the British Isles. My dad and I uh, took, take well, the family has uh, been over there many times, and so sometimes we'll we'll take little side trips. And this is on the beach of uh, Carnota, which is north of Castro Baronia, the Castro that I showed you before. This is the longest beach in Galicia, and this is what it looks like in the winter. Um, still beautiful, quite dramatic. It also has the longest orreo, and orreo is this long stone structure you see here. Uh, designed to keep grain, corn, and so forth uh, away from rodents. So continuing north on the coast, we come to the elegant city of A Coruña, which is known for its beautiful gallery windows, which you can see in the background. It's also got a wonderful harbor, which is super clean, and you can swim in it. In fact, there was a, a guy swimming in there <laughs> You can't see him in the picture, but he was swimming when we took this photo. And it's a great city. You can, you can walk around the whole city in a few hours or bike or take a taxi if you get tired. At the furthest outcrop of the city, you will come 
well, let's see, there's a look of the city center, the typical archways, and there's great restaurants down the city in La Coruña, great seafood restaurants. And it's right on the, war on the water. So at the uh, tip of the city, you come to the Torre de Hercules, which is the oldest working lighthouse in the world, apparently. It was built um, by the Romans who came to Galicia for many reasons that we'll get into to later. But uh, one of the things they did was to build this lighthouse, which still is in use to this day. Fantastic coastal views. You can city, see the city in the background there to the left. And again, this is, this is a, a, small, a small city that you can walk around in about three or four hours. Continuing north from La Coruña, we go to the Costa da Morte, which again is an example of the Galician language in Spanish would be Costa de la Muerte. Anyway, all of that translates to say, to mean the coast of death. And it's called that because again, the seas can be really, really wild and really rough and have brought many sailors and ships to their doom. So you gotta be careful where you go in for swimming. Well, you will see people fishing and swimming amongst these rocks and along the coasts. Ask, when in doubt, ask a local, <laughs> as always. And there's just so much uh, stunning natural beauty and poetry. This particular beach is popular with surfers. It's a little calmer in this cove. Um, this is again, north of Coruña. And at the top of Galicia, one of the big highlights, one of the most beautiful beaches is called the Praia das Catedrales. Catedrais, if I'm saying it correct in Galician, which in Spanish would be Playa de las Catedrales, named because these rocky outcrops look like flying buttresses. It really is quite something, quite stunning. And this is on the border of Asturias, which is a different uh, region on the north coast of Spain next to Galicia. So in just a few minutes, you could cross over into the border of Asturias. I'll show you that on the map later. From uh, this point, we go back inland towards the city of Lugo, which is famous for its Roman walls, ancient Roman walls, some of the best uh, preserved in, in Europe. It's a really charming city with a lively student population and excellent food. Doesn't look so lively here. This is after everything shut down after dinner, but it's, uh, it's quite charming to walk around at night. From Lugo, we go further south inland to the uh, province and the area called Ourense. Ourense is where the Romans went to mine for gold and to plant vines. They, Romans like their wine. So this is the uh, Rio Sil and the Canyon del Rio Sil, quite dramatic. Uh, as you can see, the cliffs plummet directly down to the river. You can take a riverboat tour through this area. It is fantastic. And as I mentioned before, the Romans came here to plant vines so you can't see it in this particular photo, but you, there are roads that you drive through that zig, zigzag back and forth. My parents can tell you it's, uh, <laughs> it's quite nerve wracking, but you'll see these amazing ancient vineyards uh, terraced up and down these cliff sides going down to the, to the river Seal. And again, this is in the province of Orense. And uh, as they say uh, in Galicia, buen camino, have a great trip. So if you go, buen camino. Just to give you a sense of what the traditional folk music sounds like, the bagpipe, which I mentioned before, the gaita. Here's una actuación de Susana Sevan con Mia Doiro. So this is the Galician bagpipe, which has things I would say it's, I'll, I'll just let you listen, but I would say it's somewhere between the Irish Yellen pipes and the Scottish bagpipe. And um, it's its own thing. So let's take a listen. <laughs>
How about that, huh? Big surprise. Most people don't, uh, don't know that about Galicia. I'm gonna put myself back on. Um, so yeah, that's the national instrument, the bagpipe. It's called the gaita. And the group you saw Susana performing with is uh, Mia Loiro. They're fantastic. And they uh, collaborate with groups you might know, for example, the Chieftains from Ireland. Every summer in the north of Galicia in a town called Ortigueira, uh, near that beach that we saw where there were cathedral-like uh, rocks, there is a big Celtic folk festival there and all the traditional Celtic folk groups from the Celtic, different Celtic nations, Brittany, England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Galicia, etc., come together and perform at this festival. And anyway, uh, Mio Doiro is, is one of the best in Galicia, really, really fantastic. And that concert was in the Plaza, which if you saw the slideshow from the beginning, the plaza next to the uh, St. James Cathedral, La Catedral de Santiago de Compostela. So it's really quite moving and quite something to see. Anyway, that's our tour of Galicia. Thank you for joining me. If you have questions about traveling there, want to know, get the insider scoop, please email me. And uh, if anyone has any questions now, I'd be glad to do my best to answer them. Um, Michael? Yes. There's one question from Tom Murtha. Sure. Uh, hey, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> How is Galicia doing economically in pre-pandemic times? Can we rightly assume that a big part of the economy is driven by tourism, especially with El Camino bringing people to the region on their pilgrimages? So what are the big three, big three activities slash enterprises supporting the economy? Tourism plus food and wine exports is my guess. Is this a good guess or are there surprises? Tom, you're right on the money. Uh, it, it is tourism indeed is one of the bigger industries. And as, as a result, Galicia has been really hard hit economically by this pandemic. Although I would say because it's a, a very uh, sparsely populated area, even though we saw some big cities, um, and because most people have access to some kind of outdoor space and because they've behaved intelligently, um, they have managed to keep the rates of COVID very low. So in terms of uh, how it's affected people, COVID deaths and so forth, yes, they've experienced that, but much to a much lesser degree than let's say Madrid or Barcelona. Um, but I know from friends who live there, uh, I mentioned before, I, I, I play music and I have many friends who are musicians and who work in the arts and they are definitely um, having a hard time because all of that is currently is currently shut down. There's the hope that it will reopen uh, the summer at least to Americans, although that might be strange and tricky because things might be more open to tourists than they might even be to locals. So I'm, I'm not really sure how that's gonna play out, but you're indeed right that uh, tourism food, wine, those are uh, fishing, all major industries. Um, I, my guess would be that, you know, fishing and agriculture are okay as they're generally outdoor activities. Um, there, uh, Vigo, the first city that we saw is a major industrial city. It's a shipbuilding city. Uh, the French car company Citroen also has uh, a plant there. So that's a, a major um, source of jobs there. Uh, let's see what else. Santiago. Fashion. Oh, and fashion. There's my wife, Martina. You, know, you might you might comment on that. Galicia is a big center for fashion. You all might know the brand Zara or Zara. Um, so that's headquarter in La Coruña. Um, and a number of other other brands. So uh, Zara, the parent company of Zara, which is called Inditex, is one of the largest private sector employers. In Galicia. So Mike is absolutely right. It's, uh, I would say, um, agriculture, uh, shipbuilding, and fashion are the three main industries. And tourism. And tourism. Yeah. And, and the question was, do we know how, how Galicia is doing? 
poorly, poorly. Mm. But in terms of COVID rates, low and under control, especially when compared to Madrid and Barcelona, I was Yeah, saying. I think the sparse population really helped in a crisis like this. It is, um, Galicia has had sadly negative uh, population growth for decades now. So we're disappearing, we're in dangerous species. You're looking at an endangered species <laughs> of Galicians. <laughs> Um, there are not too many of us, only Mike was talking about the Galician language, less than two million people worldwide speak the language. Yes. Um, and there are less than two million Galicians in Galicia. There are more Galicians in Buenos Aires, Argentina, than there are in actually in, in, in the entire region of Galicia. We are, we are a land of immigrants. Mm. Um, there was a question of, um, why are there eucalyptus trees all over Galicia? Mm, that's a very good question. Um, that's something that, so short answer is uh, wood, paper. Um, it's kind of an unfortunate thing actually because eucalyptus is basically like a giant weed that grows super fast. So it's mm. something that can be harvested quickly and give a quick return. But unfortunately, it sucks all the nutrients out of the soil as well. So it's not exactly good for the planet. Um, and they're not the kind of wild forests. I mean, Norfolk and surrounding areas, as we know, was once, once heavily forested. But there you really see how um, the forests are, are grown almost like giant vegetable patches. <laughs> um, they do have some positive properties. Um, they're a good natural uh, decongestant and they have a really nice aromatic smell. Um, but yeah, not exactly good for the environment. Um, the, the native tree is the oak, which in Spanish is called roble. And here's another linguistic difference in Galego. It's called carballo. And that's the, uh, the native tree. And there is an effort to bring back the native species and reforest Galicia with, with, more, of the, with more of the native species. Mm -hmm. That's all. Mike, in your family, do you speak Galician with Stella May? And yes, we call we that? call Stella May Stellinia, and that's that sound. The Inya is uh, very typical of the Galician and Portuguese language, and it's actually interesting to note that um, historically, linguistically speaking, uh, Portuguese comes from Galicia. So. Anyway, Martina's name as well. Uh, if she were from Madrid, she would be called Martina. But because she's from Galicia, she's known as Martina. You'll hear that name and those kind of sounds in Portugal and, and Brazil uh, as well. It's the famous uh, soccer player, Ronaldinho. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, in terms of tourism, there have been a couple of questions about um, whether public transportation is readily available and if many of the locals do speak English? Um, so to the second question, I would say no. <laughs> um, some people do because of what I mentioned before, the phenomenon of immigration, like in Martinez, the town that where her family is from on, on the coast, you will hear a lot of English. But in general, I'd say Spaniards are, 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 are a bit behind. It, it depends where you go. Um, but in terms of public transportation, the public transportation is excellent. It's amazing. There's really um, an emphasis actually on public transportation and an emphasis, I would say, I don't know if it's, I would say against uh, the automobile, but gasoline is a lot more expensive. So it takes about, mm, let's see, 50 to 60 euros to fill up the tank of an economy car, which is close to like $70. Plus the, uh, the roadways are heavily, uh, what would you say? Uh, you have to go through tolls. Mm -hmm. So a simple trip from, you know, the trip I mentioned before from Vigo to Santiago can cost you about 15 euros in tolls and then probably about at least 20 euros um, round trip at, at least. But the uh, flip side of that is the public transportation is excellent and subsidized. And so you can get from Santiago easily and cheaply if you're really great really great way to go. And the railways are very extensive. Yes. 
Michael, you must tell them how your mother has a hard time adapting to the times there and how late people stay up. It's quite a phenomenon, really, particularly yeah, that, the children. <laughs> that is a good point. Culturally, um, people have a different sense of time. Somehow, incredibly, they manage to get up and go to work every day. And I say incredibly because they stay out really late at night. Part of that might be um, because they have, uh, although not so much in Galicia, but there is the concept at least of the siesta. Um, it's, it serves a social function where families will, and it's usually the family, get together to eat in the middle of the day, usually from about one to three o'clock. And if you want, you can, of course, take a nap during that time. But also the concept of time uh, over a meal. Um, it's not like, uh, culturally speaking, you would find the United States where people are rushing to eat their sandwich in front of the computer. No way. Uh, in Spain, it's all about enjoying food and family and life to the fullest. So meals can easily go on for two to three hours. And there's even a word for that called sobre mesa, which is um, the chatter and the talk that you engage in after dinner where you have uh, ice cream and coffee and, <laughs> you know, uh, licores. And that in terms of an evening dinner can go on till one, two in the morning while the kids play in the background. <laughs> at a restaurant. So it is culturally uh, very different, but somehow they manage to go to work at eight or nine in the morning. I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's the I, I would just add that we were out one night and I think Martina said, oh, let's go and take a little bit more of a drive. And we did, and we saw adults on a playground playing and then children and everyone, it was two o'clock in the morning. And I was absolutely, intrigued and as you say it works and it's i think everyone may live longer there i don't know because they seem so content and happy and willing to live in the present they do have um one of the longest life expectancies in the world uh, spain and japan and that's that probably has to do with uh quality of the food and lifestyle um yeah it really is a wonderful place but yeah the sense of time is definitely different and actually, speaking of time, something curious I wanted to mention before, some of the shots you saw of the beaches, uh, for anyone who's still listening, um, some of those bright, sunny shots were taken at 9, 10 o'clock at night. That's a very curious and strange thing. Um, politically, and I don't mean political parties, I just mean that Spain falls under one time zone. So when it's 10 o'clock in Barcelona, it's 10 o'clock in Santiago. But in terms of the latitude where Santiago lies geographically, it's above Portugal. So if it's 10 o'clock at night in Madrid, it's nine o'clock in Galicia. So that just results in, but then it's strange. I don't completely understand. I think it's also because you're on the coast and you get all this great sun. So um, the evenings really stretch on and it's, I'm always saying like, we need to go to the beach. If we're going to go to the beach, we need to go now. And we usually won't go until six o'clock because it's sunny out until 10 o'clock. And it's less, it's cooler and a nicer time to go. So that is curious the way time works there. Well, we had one question. When is the best time to go visit? That's a very good question. I would say any time, but if you're counting on outdoor activities, definitely plan for the summer and you kind of have a <laughs> You kind of have a short window um, and it can be very unpredictable. Um, and I say short window in terms of nice weather. Um, the best months are probably July and August in terms of what we call good weather, sunny weather. Um, and as I mentioned before earlier on, it rains a lot throughout the year, but that also depends where in Galicia you are. I wasn't joking before when I said being on the um, Atlantic, sometimes it's under, under a cloud, especially in the north. In the south where we started in Vigo, closer to the border of Portugal, you get many more sunny, um, pleasant beach days. But each season has its charms and, you know, wandering the ancient medieval streets, which are glistening from a recent rain, there's, it's, really, it's really charming. So it depends what you like. I would compare it um, a lot to Oregon or uh, Maine, although you don't get the snow like you do in Maine. Oregon and Ireland, probably in terms of the weather are the places that I would compare it to uh, most. And you should just be prepared. Uh, always bring an umbrella, they say. <laughs> Michael, 
Yeah. Uh, one thing I noticed in Galicia while we were there about the, the light at night, it, that confused me at first too, because I was thinking if you were to head directly west across the Atlantic, you'd hit the, you know, you'd probably hit Virginia or something like that, but it's on the same latitude as Boston and North. Mm -hmm. And the further North you go, the less the time is, uh, the, the smaller the circumference of the earth is relative to the, the North Pole. So when you're in Alaska, uh, near the Arctic Circle in in July and August, you have tw you have 24 hours worth of sunlight, and I think it has something to do with that. It's it's the geographic size of the circumference of the Earth at that level, so it's kind of interesting. I, I was a, a bit, uh, you know, not only were the pictures taken there at 9:30 at night, but the family <laughs> says, "Oh, well, let's go to the beach," and everybody says, "Fine, we'll go." And it's eight o'clock at night, which is kind of unusual. And by the time you get there, it's 930 and it's bright. And But the water's so cold, nobody goes in anyway, as they say. <laughs> um, and the other thing I was thinking when they were talking about economically, the wine industry there is tremendous also. I mean, that's food and beverage, but in and of itself, uh, the, the wines of uh, Galicia are some of the most famous in, in all of Europe and they're, they're excellent wines too. So, and I, and I also... Um, found out while I was there that they're big in the granite industry <laughs> and that they ship granite uh, for building supplies all over the place uh, in Europe and elsewhere. So it's, it's pretty diverse, but, it, but small. And it's a, it's a fabulous place to go. Also, it's crowded, relatively speaking, in the summer, but very few Americans. You don't hear English that much and you don't see many Americans who are there. And uh, so, and it's an ideal place to go. And I, yes, we're, a little biased, but I'm also saying if you want to go to a place you've never been before, that's interesting and different. And you, the food is good, and the architecture is fantastic, and the wine's not bad. It's kind of no, not bad. It's excellent. It's uh, kind of hard to think of a reason not to go. So anybody who's thinking of going, you should go. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were all thinking of going at this point. You've really got us sold on it. And Michael, um, as we wrap things up, um, there was a question about. Can you recommend any good books that we can read, either fiction or nonfiction, about Galicia? Mm. Martini will be able to speak to that better. I know one of the most famous contemporary authors there is a guy named Man Manuel Rivas. Uh, but um, let's see, there's also, um, well, Martini, you want to speak to that? You, you, you know better. Yes, yes. Uh, there, there was a book that was translated into English and it was quite um, successful. I saw it in many bookstores. It's called La Sombra del Viento, The Shadow of the Wind. Um, Barcelona, though, no? Or it, is, it is a family that is originally from Barcelona and it extends into Galicia. And it's about... My favorite book. Is that right? Absolutely. I yes. love that book. Isn't it wonderful? Carlos, Carlos Luis Zafón. Oh, uh, oh yeah. it's just fantastic. I highly recommend it. And mm -hmm. he's written I loved it too. In <laughs> fact, I told you, Anne, to, to- You told me and I read it and I'm just, I, I would really recommend it. It's a beautifully written book that really, you feel the setting, the physical setting of what he's writing about. And if that's, um, whether it's Barcelona or Galicia, it's- worth reading. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I loved it too. Yeah, and we would be uh, happy to, uh, if people are interested, provide a list of a uh, more detailed list of things to see and do and read and also things like Galicia and music, Galicia in cinema. Um, let's think there was a great movie with Javier Bardem, uh, uh, a true uh, sort of a biop, not a biopic, but a, a, a story about a guy who was, uh, what was the name of that, Martin? <laughs> um, well, we'll provide a list of, 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 there's a show on Netflix you could see. It's, it shows kind of a. Not when he wanted to die. What's that? Not the one when he wanted to die. Yes, that one. <laughs> oh, that one. Oh my that God. That one, Paul, yeah. like paraplegic and. Uh... Yes, that was oh, very well received the movie. What's the name of it? It's, um. Gina will look it up. I can't remember the name, but that would be wonderful if you would provide us and we can certainly email everybody who registered for this program with a list of great books and movies. 
The Sea Inside is the name of the movie. Yeah. And it was nominated for an Oscar in the best foreign movie category. So that is based around the area where originally my family come from, where Mike showed that dolmen, that a prehistoric, it's, it's based on that area. And just as a matter of interest, of course, being Galicia, that, that man was somehow related to me. It's like, it was like a third. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, I think um, maybe we'll wrap things up. I want to thank everyone for attending and especially thank Michael for this wonderful presentation and Martina for your um, input. And we just, our virtual vacations are, have been fabulous and hopefully we will continue to take them, but I'm sure you're very anxious to get back there in person as soon as you can. We'll be there at the end of June. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, great. I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. Great. So thank you everybody for joining us tonight and um, hope to see everyone in person. Um, the library is open and we welcome everyone to come in whenever they would like to. So thank you all. And uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you. It was hey. wonderful. Yeah. Nice I want to go back. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Road trip. Right. Road trip. <laughs> exactly, Eileen. We're going. All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.